welcome to Spokane Talks, where you find news, views, and conversation that includes respect for opinions, facts, and diversity. Spokane Talks is brought to you in part by McNeese Wheeler Attorneys and Rana Payne. Welcome to this special edition of Spokane Talks. I'm Ryan McNeese. In this episode, I'll have an opportunity to sit down with Christina Anderson, 2007 survivor of the Virginia Tech shooting, and discuss her foundation, the Kashka Foundation, discussing the complexities of surviving a tragic incident and learning from past incidents, followed by Adam Jackson, commercial and professional banker at Mountain West Bank. Hi, this is uh, Larry at River Ridge Hardware. Just wanted the opportunity to show you a little bit about our Christmas. We have Christmas tree stands. We have ornaments that you won't find anywhere else. We have the small Christmas lights. We have the tube lights that you can run up and down. We also have a massive amount of snow shovels. Come on out and visit River Ridge Hardware. The following is sponsored by our friends and community supporters at McNeese Wheeler Attorneys. McNeese Wheeler is a boutique law firm in Spokane, handling matters in both Washington and Idaho. Areas of law include business law, wills, trusts and estates, family law, personal injury and wrongful death, and real estate matters. For your full service legal needs, contact McNeese Wheeler Attorneys. Welcome to the show. I'm Ryan McNeese, and we have the unique pleasure to have Christina Anderson here in the studio with us. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Uh, obviously, uh, extremely important topic. We're here talking about school safety, and you are a survivor of 2007 Virginia mm -hmm. Tech shooting. Uh, it goes without saying, an unbelievable uh, an event. Talk, talk to us a little bit about that and then we'll move forward as to what that has led to on a positive note in your life and for uh, the endeavors that you've done in the years since. Absolutely. So the shooting happened in April 2007. It was uh, April 16th, a very dreary, typical cold Monday mm -hmm. morning and I was a student at Virginia Tech so I was about halfway through my academic career. I was doing international studies and foreign languages and that morning I was headed to a French class which many of my friends you know later thought that I would skip class they didn't believe mm. that I was there I was not the best student <laughs> at, the, yeah. at that point I wished you weren't there exactly yeah um, but uh, the shooting happened in a building that I was not very familiar with and so what we didn't know was that the perpetrator who was a student also at Virginia Tech he had you know planned quite extensively for the attack so he had purchased uh, chains in advance to lock the door shut from the inside. And so shortly after, myself and my friend that drove me to class that morning went to the building. He kind of followed in afterwards. He chained the door shut and uh, went to the second floor, which is where the shooting occurred. And for about 11 and a half minutes, he would walk into about four or five different classrooms and, and open fire. And unfortunately, you know, it's a very, it's a mathematics engineering building. So we yeah. all have these very small constricted spaces right. were all taken by surprise. Um, I did not realize it was gunshots, you know, initially. Uh, most, you know, you, your head doesn't usually go to. Well, and I've heard individuals in other issues talk about that, that mm -hmm. it, uh, it sounds like something different or it's not equating at the time. Right, because gunshots, I, I would imagine, I'm not too familiar with, with weapons, mm -hmm. you know, I, I don't like them for reasons you can probably understand. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a separate, separate issue, but uh, gunshots, depending on the caliber and the type of space that you're in, so echoes and the how, how wide and how deep walls are, I mean, all those things play into how it sounds. Plus, Remember, it's 9, 9.15 on a Monday morning, and you're sitting in a building, right? <laughs> in fringe class. Yeah. Whether you're a receptionist or you're in a hospital or you're working, you, your first thought isn't, oh, someone's shooting inside yeah, of this Yeah, those are obviously gunshots. Spots. It's outside your psychological expectation. Exactly, exactly. And your mind tries to find logic and reasoning as to what that mm -hmm. is. Well, that inevitably takes some time. 
and often because of the level of preparation the attacker has taken, you don't you might have only a few seconds. And so, I've also interviewed other survivors, and we often hear uh, for the explanation of noise, you know, uh, construction work. Mm -hmm. Fireworks sometimes is, is a descriptor, um, but now with other survivors, we're very attuned to loud noises, you know, escalating sounds, uh, dishes clanging, things like that. So, um, so he, you know, very quickly kind of bursts into into our room. None of our rooms had locks, so it was very hard to barricade a door if he didn't have the time to do so. And uh, he would come in about th well, three times total, and I was shot uh, in the back. Came in and out of your particular room three times. Yes. So he hmm. walked in and just open fire very very quickly, unfortunately, and not a lot of time to understand what was happening and to prepare and things like that. And every single person but one in my classroom was wounded. So he left. Uh, he essentially has, you know, the entire hallway blocked off and kind of has access to it. So we have one room where thankfully the students were able to keep the door closed the entire time. They put desks and their bodies up against the door. We have another classroom where students jumped out of the window. So they jumped 19 feet to the sidewalk, so they had broken limbs and things like that, but they thankfully survived. Our room, I think just by the virtue of the, the surprise factor and things like that, there was very little movement mm -hmm. and opportunity to react. And so um, now one, th one of the things that I teach and talk about is the ability to safely go check, you know, what is that sound, and either to take your own personal action to leave or call the police or to notify your coworkers or your classmates, whatever the situation might be, can be very, very helpful for people in that situation. Well, and uh, the psychology is immense. Uh, I think we could literally talk for uh, hours about uh, the different types of things that are going through your mind in terms of uh, you're laying on the floor, hiding behind the respective desks that you indicate. What are you thinking at that particular moment, or are you? It's more of a fight or flight, probably. It's very much a fight or flight, unless you have prepared, you know, prepared your body and your mind to respond to those types of events, mm -hmm. which is really only on a tactical law enforcement level that you could that could be reached. Not at nine thirty in the morning. Not as a student right. that yes is uh, you know barely knows her way to class. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, could barely drive a car probably you know without enough coffee. It's it's hard to comprehend and the sheer level of I mean. I'm often asked, you know, did, did he say anything? Should should one negotiate in that way? Unfortunately, if you're if you're type, if you're face that type of predatory violence, they've already made their decision for what they're going to do, mm -hmm. and so there's very little time for you to say to interrupt or to potentially talk to them. They've often kind of you know put their testimony in in an interview in a, in a handwritten manifesto. They they know they're going to die that day, so you don't have a lot of time. So I was thinking, obviously what's going on, you know, mm -hmm. trying to assess the level of risk and concern. Often, this is what I did, you look around at those around you. And so if people aren't moving, if people aren't, aren't seeming to be, you know, worried or alert, you're just kind of like, oh, it's, you know, no one wants to overreact and be that person who's right. like, run or get out. Which is never a situation you've ever been in to identify with how, exactly. how you react. Yeah. Many of us have very few previous experiences to draw upon. We really only get fire drill training as mm -hmm. we grow up in the educational system. And so my professor went in the hallway, and the way that she came back, the look on her face, the change in color, plus we hear gunshots in the hallway as they're moving up, you start to put two and two together. And so I got very quickly under my desk. I, the desks were all one unit type of you know, heavy kind of tools. And so I put my feet under that, my stomach on the seat, and essentially I was preparing for an earthquake type of, I went mm. to school in California for a few years. so. The training of you know get down low and don't move. You know, in earthquake drills, you don't move around. You just right. stay there until someone tells you to, to move. Helped. Um, I was in the back of the room. I had some advantageous positioning in that he was never directly close to me, and thankfully he missed. So right he... after this event, and of course there's pictures that have been national, global, et cetera, of you mm -hmm. uh, after this event. What goes through your mind as a survivor? Obviously, there's uh, the psychology of, of parents and friends that are involved, of those that have been lost. But I'd imagine there's an interesting and unique psychology as a survivor. Uh, that you know, why why didn't you pass? You were shot three times, critically wounded. What goes through your mind as a survivor? Everything in your life changes as a survivor. For me personally. The things I eat, uh, how I have conversations with people, and how quickly do you tell someone that you survived this event? Now it's mm -hmm. been almost 12 years, so dating, <laughs> right. you know, Thanksgiving, like every single aspect changes. And to your your point, the concept of survivor's guilt is one of the most 
frequent and probably you know inevitable uh, ones. I can't tell you why he did this, and I can't tell you why I survived. And those are the most difficult things to to sit with. Um, you naturally start to go through you know all the what ifs, and it took me a couple of years to, with really great therapists and really trained practitioners, to understand. The, that I was having normal reactions to a very abnormal situation and that it wasn't my fault. And that, you know, the biggest grief is that 11 of my classmates passed away and they were my age. Mm -hmm. So as I get older, I, I have decisions that I take that I can make that they don't have the right to do, right? And so I think about, am I living my best life? Am I doing things for the right reasons? That, that phrase that you just utilized, am I living my best life? I think that's probably an <clears throat> Oprah phrase. But. Well, I, I think it is an appropriate phrase because I think how you've taken this uh, tragedy is commendable in terms of you just indicated, I can't change or know why I didn't pass away. Mm -hmm. But what you have done, you've started a foundation called mm -hmm. the Kashka Foundation. Yes. So uh, identify for us what the purpose, uh, the goal, Mm -hmm. uh, what you've been accomplishing with the Kashka Foundation. So the goal is to provide education and training for schools, organizations, law enforcement on how to prevent these types of incidents from happening. It's trying to gain more awareness for that we all have a personal responsibility mm -hmm. to be aware of situations, to report those, and essentially using the stories of survivors. So I work with individuals who have survived Columbine High School, many school shootings, workplace incidents, to frame their experiences in a way that helps someone else understand that this could happen to you. I travel places where someone will still tell me this will never happen in my community. And I've been to Littleton, Colorado. I've been to, obviously, Virginia Tech and mm -hmm. a lot of other sites. No one thinks it's going to happen to them. Right, the movie theater incident. Or in Aurora, Aurora exactly. Colorado. You know, it, it's never it's never indicative of the place. It's the people that are in the place that you want to take care of. It's the people in the place who will, will inevitably make up how strong that safety culture is. Locks and doors and cameras, all those things are very important as well. But if we allow the person who doesn't work there anymore to walk mm -hmm. into you and they're looking for their spouse, you've now defeated all the security systems that you've paid for. So our shooter was on our campus for about two years exhibiting some pretty strange behaviors mm -hmm. that were never shared or communicated. And that's where I want them to pay attention and to speak up and to take those to appropriate channels. So the foundation works to help either increase awareness for the prevention aspect, sometimes the response of you know active shooter training, what do you do if type right. of scenarios. And then often we also consult with after an event has occurred, you know, as you can imagine, the long-term recovery for what do you do at the six month, nine mark, two year mark, right. it changes. So we try to get some perspective based on those that have been there to just give them different examples and of what's appropriate. what can appropriate. we learn? What can we learn is mm -hmm. probably the overall theme. Absolutely. And, and uh, thankfully you are here in Spokane having an mm -hmm. opportunity to speak at Gonzaga University yes. on the School Safety Forum. and. Unfortunately, as you're well aware, we also had a shooting here in Spokane at Freeman High School. Mm -hmm. So you being here, appreciate it. Uh, it couldn't be more relevant as to uh, further ideas of what can we learn. Uh, what, do you, what do you think with the panel here in Spokane, uh, how are we going to encompass uh, how we can move forward and learn from these events? So the first focus of the panel is on you know, the shared responsibility for safety and security. So we have some really great different perspectives from education, from threat assessment, from school policing, uh, restorative justice angles for the sense that school safety is much broader than mm -hmm. shootings. It's about culture and, and about keeping everyone happy and safe and, and, and positive in, in the environment. From a moving forward and kind of, you know, it's I think thinking about how do we honor those that are affected? How do we take care of all mm -hmm. the students that may be have gone to school in, in Freeman, right? Or have siblings that knew someone who was impacted. How do we, a lot of times people will say things like, well, I wasn't in that school or I wasn't shot. Yeah. And so they're going to stay in our school system without realizing they also have traumatic responses that are valid around the anniversary, around that time of year. Everyone's gonna remember where they were the day of, you know, in September Absolutely. of last year. And so almost saying that it's okay to have those reactions and that you should take care of yourself and and, and honor that. Is well, and for you personally, <clears throat> I'd imagine as you lead up to these respective anniversaries, uh, you probably physically and emotionally go through uh, some uh, Different speci stages. Yeah, specific <laughs> stages. Uh, talk to us a little bit about that. It's taken a few years to figure out that the anniversary is a really important year and, and a hard time. Mm -hmm. So I usually try to 
make a mental checkpoint in March, so about a month before the anniversary, to exercise more, to eat better, you know, take care of myself, things like that. I realize that I'm very, I'm almost like preparing for a funeral is mm -hmm. how it feels like because the rest of the year you can distract yourself with with work with personal engagements with you know I'm still involved in this field so just learning and whatever traveling but then you come back to I'm also a victim mm -hmm. and a survivor of the event and that um, it, it kind of grounds me to be near my family again to make sure that I'm just spending some more time with them and and acknowledging the event but not staying too deeply in the facts of, of April 16th mm -hmm. on 7. But uh, it's just a reminder for my family and I that life is very, is very precious. So we usually have dinner together. Sometimes I'll get a strange gift from my parents. I got a suitcase one year because they're very practical parents. <laughs> <laughs> um, but as a moment of like, this is your second birthday, right? We're just right. so happy to have you and things like that. So I uh, sometimes will return to Virginia Tech. I've gone back several times to, uh, to the memorial and we'll, we'll be with other survivors and families as well, which is really helpful to see I'd that. I imagine that's important in the manifestations of the, uh, <clears throat> the relationships and the psychology of, of meeting with uh, survivors and being on the actual uh, geographic location of these events. Yeah, it's nice to be able to paint more positive and make new mm -hmm. memories with them because mm -hmm. now they have children, they have spouses, we, we know their parents really well at this point. You know, there was 17 that were physically injured that come back and many of those that lost their, their parents and uh, their siblings. So it, it's a really big community of survivors and nobody else really understands what that experience was like. No, and I'd imagine uh, in your opportunities to travel throughout the country, I'd imagine you get a lot of folks saying, I understand. I, I understand what you've been through, and you probably do have that reaction of, mm, no, you don't. Most uh, people are pretty kind about saying, you know, I, I feel so bad for you. I, I have no idea yeah, what you went through. can't imagine what you've gone through, but exactly. not necessarily that I know what you're feeling. I think what's most impressive to me is how you've uh, taken a horrific event that you had to endure uh, as a young person. You're 19 years old. <clears throat> at the time of this uh, event, but you've taken this uh, horrific event and turned it into such a positive. There are people throughout the country that you've been seeing, whether it be in Florida, whether it be in Colorado or California or what have you, you've made this your life's passion to help others. Uh, it, it's really impressive. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, we should add there are many survivors doing amazing work, mm -hmm. either full-time capacities or, or part-time. There's a group called the Rebels Project, which is an mm -hmm. online support group created actually after the Aurora movie theater shooting by mm -hmm. Columbine grads. What was it, Rebels? The Rebels Project. Mm -hmm. So it was started by Columbine High School graduates. Their, their mascot is the Rebels. And it's an online support group for anyone who lives in a community or themselves were personally you know, impacted by a mass shooting or any type of tragedy event. And people just post questions of, this news interview really triggered me. How do you handle watching news coverage of future events or anniversaries and support and things like that? So we call ourselves the club you don't want to belong to. Right, but yeah. you're making the most of the fact that you do belong to the club. Trying to. And yeah. again, your theme uh, to live your best life, uh, make the most out of this event and help others. Thank you so much for being here. Of course. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Next up on Business Talks, Adam Jackson, professional and commercial banker at Mountain West Bank. Welcome to the show. I'm Ryan McNeese, and we're here in the studio with Adam Jackson, commercial professional banker at Mountain West Bank. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. I, I, I appreciate it. You're, you're a busy guy. Uh, recently in the last year, uh, nominated as uh, 20 under 40 mm -hmm. in Catalyst as a professional mm -hmm. uh, on the rise here in Spokane. Yeah. Uh, and as a, as a banker uh, and at Mountain West Bank, mm -hmm. a lot of resources available to you in terms of marketing. How do you, yeah. how do you go about uh, finding the markets that you want to be involved in uh, for your clients? Absolutely. You know, over the last few years, we just you kind of take a assessment of where where the market's going and, mm -hmm. and different industries that you find you find interesting. And so um, we have a wonderful medical community mm -hmm. here in Spokane. Um, so I've definitely focused on you know the medical professionals, the dental professionals, and then you know CPAs and attorneys, and mm -hmm. because you're you're working with a lot of those folks, getting these types of deals put together. And so. 
um, try to market and and network with with the, within those groups and it kind of spreads like wildfire fire from there. So. Well, and as as you've indicated, I think when you do good work within mm-hmm. a community, that that word does get out there amongst the doctors, the CPAs, yeah. attorneys, etc. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and you're right, our medical community statistically is one of the largest aspects of our yeah. our uh, economy here. Yeah. Uh, in, in terms of what's going on with rates right now mm-hmm. in the Federal Reserve, there's hot topics there. Uh, mm-hmm. d- do you see that as, as uh, playing a significant part in the business that you're seeing? Absolutely. I mean, anytime you talk rates, it's kind of a sensitive topic. Mm-hmm. Um, Absolutely. And we definitely have seen an increase in rates over the last year. Um, we're having to just have those conversations up front and, and kind of frame you know, frame conversations in that aspect and say, look, you know, a year ago, we were 100 basis points lower than than we are right now. And it's it's not a bad thing. It's just something that we're dealing with. I would agree, Adam, not a bad thing. But as you indicated, uh, something to certainly take into consideration Mm -hmm. when making long term financial decisions about whether it's buying a dental practice or Mm -hmm. selling Mm -hmm. a dental practice. Yep. Uh, Makes sense on on both sides. Yeah. uh, also, uh, because of your involvement in banking and mm-hmm. within the professional community, you've been significantly involved in Hoop Fest Spokane, yes. which has also led to an involvement as you fly out tomorrow yeah. uh, to participate in Hoop Fest uh, in Las Vegas. Yeah. We're going to take a short little break and come back, and I would like to hear about uh, your significant involvement yep. in those organizations. Perfect. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the show. I'm Brian McNeese, and we're here in the studio with Adam Jackson and commercial professional banker, Mountain West Bank. But just before the break, we were talking about your significant involvement in Hoop Fest Spokane yeah. uh, that has now led to participating as of tomorrow. You're flying to mm-hmm. Las Vegas. So yeah. tell me about both aspects, Spokane mm-hmm. and what you're doing in Las Vegas. Absolutely. So Spokane started uh, when I was a kid. Um, mm-hmm. My dad was one of the founding board members. And I was about four years old when this idea was kind of hatched. And, and the fact that you're 50 now. No, I've I'll, aged yeah, really well. Right, you, so, yeah. Um, but yeah, 30 years later, we're, we're sitting here and the event's going as strong as it mm-hmm. ever has been. Um, and that has kind of led to this opportunity to, to assist other communities in, in bringing our expertise you know, down to Las Vegas and, and help them mm-hmm. run run their tournament down and, there. And we've so. discussed this before. Mm-hmm. It, it's exciting that you are going to take the strategic uh, and expertise of what's happened in Spokane to Las Vegas, yeah. but it, it hasn't necessarily across the country mm-hmm. uh, been duplicated, no. the success in Spokane. So it is a challenge. Yeah, it absolutely is. And mm. we've, for, for whatever reason, I mean, through a lot of, you know, trials and and whatnot right. have kind of come up with this magic formula that has has worked um it's it's worked in spokane and we hope to you know replicate that elsewhere right. with within these other communities so well, it, but it is weird how it hasn't really i mean you think of there's much bigger markets um with a lot more mm-hmm. resources and and we still have the best product out the there psychology so. is fascinating and, yeah. and uh I'd like to just chalk it up to obviously incredible strategic approach. Uh, the mm-hmm. board, Matt Santangelo, mm-hmm. but the loyalty of Spokane, absolutely to basketball and yeah. to Spokane as a brand. Yep. Yep. Uh, yep. No, it's an it's impressive, and I think you said nearing its thirtieth year. Mm-hmm. So, yep. well, uh, as as that circles back to banking, mm-hmm. uh, you see a bright future. Absolutely. It, it, it's ex- it's exciting to see. I know you've hit the ground running. You're mm-hmm. extremely excited to be at uh, Mountain West Bank yeah. and making inroads within our community, not absolutely. only here, but also in Coeur d'Alene as yeah. well. Yep, absolutely. I mean, the bank was founded over in Coeur d'Alene 25 years ago, and we've just, I mean, tried to be a staple and, and good steward of the business community. So wow. very excited. Thank you, Adam. Appreciate yeah. you being here. Thank you so Thank much, you. Ryan. Thank you for joining us on this special edition of Spokane Talks. Please join us next week for more news, views, and conversation.
Spokane Talks is about you. Give us your feedback and comments at info at spokanetalksmedia.com. Spokane Talks is brought to you in part by McNeese Wheeler Attorneys and Rada Paint. We'll be back next week with additional news, views, and conversations. Please join us. So long for now. <laughs>